so um, I actually uh, th this video I uh, I recorded it a while ago and the oops the original video was about an hour and I create the video and I start to listen to my video on the other computer and the uh, little intro music plays and then there's no audio and there was no audio for an hour so that was a blow that was a real blow I I needed to I need to recuperate from that one because um, that actually really hurt okay but this time it's if it if it doesn't work I'm probably literally going to cry I will literally cry I will shed tears because that, because that was not fun all right um okay so this section is about measures of variability so last section we discussed measures of location let's start by justifying why we need measures of variability consider these three data sets and I'm going to construct a dot plot for each of these data sets. So I've got uh, three lines for my three dot plots, data set one, data set two, data set three. Uh, and in the, these dot plots, I'm going to uh, start uh, with one and then end in uh, 12. And uh, in between, I've got six. So, uh, so uh, let's see, I'm going to have we're going to keep these all on the same scale. So 1, 12, 6, 1, 12, uh, 6, and uh, we'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, Oops, five, six. Okay, that's 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 a little inexcusable. We're gonna have to try a little harder on that one. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. So I've now got these three number lines, and let's start with data set one. So we've got numbers. At uh, so four, five, six, seven, eight, and then we've got one at uh, two, five, six, seven, ten, and then finally we have one, three, six, nine, uh, nine, and then eleven. Okay, so look at these three dot plots now uh, I want you to let's let's first start actually by uh, computing the mean and the median for each of these data sets so data set 1 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 uh, that is going to add up to 36 the second data set well we subtract 2 from 4 to get 2 but then add 2 to 8 to get 10 so that second one is also going to add up to 36 and for the third one you kind of are going to do the same trick so they all add up to 36 which then means that the sample mean is going to be 36 divided by, there's six observations, no, actually there's five. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, they don't add up to 36. They don't add up to 36. Oh, silly Curtis, silly Curtis. They add up to 30. So the sample mean will be 30 divided by five, which equals six, which is also equal to the median. Because you look at them, because these data sets are ordered, they have five observations. So the third row is going to correspond to the median. So that means that the mean and the median for these data sets are all the same. And yet, let's suppose now that I were to ask, tell you that this was the waiting time for the train. Uh, which of these data sets would you prefer to be the observed waiting times for the train? Probably the first one, at least if you're like me, because for myself, I actually did not really like inconsistent trains. I mean, it's kind of cool that this train will 
there might be a one minute waiting time uh, for this train, but there also could be an 11 minute waiting time for this train. And one way or the other, I would just love it if trains always showed up exactly six minutes um, between, which, okay, admittedly around here, they generally do do that. But um, you don't really like a lot of variability in the wait time for the train because that makes the train unreliable. That said, this aspect of the data set is not being captured by uh, our measures of location, the sample mean and the sample median, unfortunately. So, and the reason why is because the attribute that we're talking about is an attribute that doesn't have anything to do with the location. These lo data sets are located at essentially the same place. They, it has to do instead with spread. And we now have a pictographic method for understanding spread. We can see that these data sets have different spread but we would like to have some numerical measures. So very quickly, I'm just gonna say that I would prefer one because it's more consistent or less spread. Okay, um, what we need is a measure of variability to describe how spread out a data set is. Uh, how could we possibly do that? Well, we might start uh, by examining deviations, which where we look at xi and subtract out the sample mean, and and if we were to add these up together, this might give us a measure for um, how spread out the data set is. But here's the thing, though, when we try that, um, we're going to sum up from i equals one to n. Uh, no, that should be a one. So from i equals one to n, uh, x i minus x bar. And this is a sum. Sums are linear, which means that I can now break up this sum into two sums and say that this is going to be a sum from i equals one to n, x i minus um, the sum from i equals one to n x bar. But here's the thing about that latter sum. See, uh, this is actually adding up a constant n times. And you probably remember from second grade what it means to add up a, the same number n times. You end up with multiplication. So this number is going to actually end up being n times x bar. Okay. And this number also can be interpreted as n times x bar because it is the sum of the observations divided by the sample size and then multiplied by the sample size again. So we end up with n x bar minus n x bar and that equals zero. So what that means is that this quantity is always equal to zero, always equal to zero. Hmm, I think I found a dead spot on my screen. <laughs> okay, so that always adds up to zero, uh, which means, I mean, the issue is that these deviations, they always have the same sign. Uh, well, okay, the they, they all have, um, they are, all right, what I just said was literally false. Um, they don't always have the same sign, in fact, uh, you have opposite signs, you have some positive, some negative deviations, and it turns out that uh, the positive and negative deviations cancel each other out. So you end up with a zero. Um, so that didn't quite work, although there was an interesting idea there. Um, looking at the distance between an observation and the sample mean, and one might be tempted to try this. Replace the parentheses with absolute values. So you end up adding up the absolute value of xi minus x bar, and um, that now you don't have that issue of negatives and positives canceling each other out because everything will be positive, and you'll end up with a positive number. And that makes sense. Um, the thing though is, this is actually more difficult from a mathematical perspective to work with. 
Um, and the reason why is because it's involving absolute values, and absolute values are not differentiable. Absolute values, if you remember from uh, Calculus 1, they have a cusp, a, a sharp point, and sharp points are not differentiable. Uh, compare that instead to, so this is like the absolute value of x, compare that instead with the function x squared, that should work. I mean, that, that has the uh, nice feature of being differentiable. So what actually statisticians end up doing is they say we should add up the sum from i equals 1 to n xi minus x bar squared. And this quantity is known as the sum of squared errors. Xi minus x bar, a term that statisticians like to use for that, is the error. And um, uh, we're adding up the squared errors. Uh, and th there is, in fact, an interpretation for, uh, for the square part, which is maybe you remember... This is how I like to think of it. I think that this formula kind of rhymes with x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2. Do you remember that? Do you remember that from geometry class? If you take the square root of this quantity, you end up with the distance formula for Euclidean distance, for Euclidean geometry. And it actually kind of rhymes with that sum that I've drawn, that I've uh, shown uh, up above. So, uh, and, and in fact, there is um, a very deep connection between uh, the sum of squared errors and Euclidean geometry. Um, but this quantity, to me, like it, that seems like an appropriate way to think about distance. And if we if we were to average this by by saying like this is one over n, we would have an average squared distance. Now, that's actually a good idea, but um, there's a better idea, which is to divide instead of by n, by n minus 1. Now, that might strike you as a little bit odd. Why is it that we're dividing by n minus 1? Uh, there's a few reasons for that, some of which we'll talk about later in maybe chapter 6. But uh, n minus 1, there's actually a term for this quantity, and it's known in this, in this uh, context as the degrees of freedom. And why are we dividing by the degrees of freedom rather than n? I'm going to present to you a few arguments for why you'd want to do that. Um, for starters, let's imagine that we had a data set of size 1. Right, so there's only one observation in our data set. What we're trying to measure right now is, uh, is a spread in the data set. If we had a data set of size 1, is there really any way to estimate spread. How can you determine the spread from a data set of one observation? Um, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And it seems like something has fundamentally gone wrong in that situation. And when you divide by n, it's not going to reveal that something is wrong. But when you divide by n minus 1, a sample size of 1 is explicitly forbidden because you cannot divide by 0. Okay. So that's one way to think. That that's one way to think that maybe n minus one is more appropriate. Um, and then, uh, uh, secondly, uh, what we're actually doing with this number, we actually call this. We we've given this number a name as statisticians. This is known as the variance, the sample variance. Now, maybe you recall from previous sections uh, my saying that there is a sample mean, and you can actually talk about a population mean. And there's a sample median, and you could talk about a population median. And there is a sense in which the sample mean estimates the population mean, and the, medi and the sample median estimates the population median. So the sample variance should estimate the population variance. There is, in fact, a population variance. But here's the thing, though, about the population variance. Um, our estimator, if we were to divide by n, would have a tendency to be too small. I mean, it would still be close, 
to the population variance. But you could be a little bit better by dividing by n minus 1 instead of n. If you were to divide by n, you'd actually be a little too small. So we should divide by n minus 1 instead. There's a term called biasness that we will discuss more in chapter 6. But long story short, it turns out that when you divide by n minus 1, you have an unbiased estimator for the population variance. Whereas if you divide by n, there is a very small bias. Now, that said, you can still divide by n and have a reasonable estimator. It just will have that bias problem. The bias gets really small as you increase the sample size, but it is still there. So why not just get rid of it? Um, so these are some uh, potential arguments for why you should be dividing by n minus 1. And later on in, cha in that chapter, we will actually, uh, I may actually show that if you compute the expected value and you divide by n minus 1, you get the sample variance. But uh, we're a long ways off from that. So accept it that you pretty much have to divide by n minus 1 instead of n, although it is still reasonable to think of this as um, uh, like an average squared distance. Oh yes, another argument for why you should uh, be dividing by n minus one. Uh, when you have when you compute the variance, there's something you have to do first. You have to compute the sample mean. You have to compute the sample mean first, and there's a penalty that you have to pay for that. The term degrees of freedom means that if you this is basically the number of observations in the data set that you are allowed to change um and where you can change those observations um freely and you could still end up with the same sample mean um it because it turns out for basically the reason that i showed up here uh this 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 line of reasoning that um, if you know n minus 1 of the observations and you know the sample mean, then you know the nth observation that you didn't list out before. So the sample mean contains information. And the fact that you had to estimate a parameter before you could estimate the sample variance means that you need to divide, that, that it means that there's in some sense a penalty to your sample size. Um, so it's inappropriate to divide by n minus 1. You now need to, or d to divide by n. You now need to divide by n minus 1. All right, now here's the thing about the sample variance that we don't like. Uh, think about the units of these things. Let's say that we were talking about feet, or going back to some examples, or even for this uh, soccer data set that I've seen in a few videos in the past, uh, where we're tracking the goal score by um, a little league soccer team. Uh, if we were talking about goals, then this right here is a goal for a game, so its units are goals. The sample mean is also in goals, because you add up goals, divide by something without units, you end up with goals. And you have goals minus goals, so you still, in that difference, have goals. But then you square, and you end up with goals squared. What the heck are, skull, or are goals squared? That's a unit that doesn't mean anything to us. We don't like the fact that in the end, the sample variance produces squared units. We would rather have an est uh, some uh, measure of spread that is in the same units as the data set. And there is such a measure called the sample standard deviation. So the sample standard deviation is s, which is equal to the square root of s squared. So s squared is the sample variance, s is the sample standard deviation. So we'll call that SD. Right? I mean, it's right there. So uh, the sample standard deviation. So yes, um, since you've taken the square root of the variance, uh, you now take the square root of goals squared and now end up the with the unit goals, which is what you want. So the sample standard deviation will be in the same units as the data set, and we like that. Um, furthermore, um, it is still reasonable to think of the sample standard deviation as measuring the average distance of an observation from the mean, or a typical distance. 
All right, so continuing on. Uh, there are, in fact, population analogs to these quantities, uh, such as the um, such as uh, the population variance and the population standard deviation, and those will be discussions for a later chapter. I believe that's chapter uh, three. So um, now, when you're computing the sample variance, another way to write it, if we write if we define S X X as the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi minus x bar squared, we could say that the sample variance, which is what you need to compute for the sample mean, is equal to s x x divided by n minus 1. The thing, though, is a lot of people don't like to compute the deviations and then square them. So compute the mean and then compute the deviations and by sub subtracting the mean from the observations and squaring them. People don't seem to like to do that. So when doing stuff by hand, it's often easier to use this shortcut formula where you add up the observations squared and then subtract uh, the mean squared multiplied with n. And it is in fact possible to show, and because this is the second time I'm recording this video, I'm not going to show it because I'm tired. Um, it is possible to show that these two quantities are the same. And I would say, I'm gonna leave this as an exercise to you. If you are curious, if you're uh, thinking you're probably going to take some more advanced stats classes, why don't you take a second to show uh, that these two quantities, uh, the, uh, sum, uh, the sum of squared errors and this shortcut formula are the same. Um, but I'm just going to leave it for now that these are, in fact, the same number. So uh, that, gives, that could help you potentially save some time uh, when computing... The sample variance by hand. Okay, so uh, let's start out. Let, let's now start looking at examples. In example 14, we're going to compute the sample variance and sample standard deviation of the soccer game scores. Uh, so here are the scores to set again. Uh, length is an R function. Uh, length of so soccer in R is known as a vector, and the length of the ve of a vector will tell you how many objects are in that vector. So um, there's also an R function called summary, which will give you uh, some basic statistical summaries for a data set stored uh, in a vector. Or actually, summary is um, um, summary will give you some basic statistical information about lots of things. Uh, but that we're going to leave that for the R lab. Um, for now, it's just giving us some basic statistics for an, a vector. And I'm now going to compute uh, the sample variance of um, this uh, data set. Okay, so uh, I like to create a table uh, when computing this by hand. If you don't want to watch me compute this by hand, uh, because it is kind of a tedious calculation. If you don't want to watch it, this is a part that you can skip over. Um, all right, anyway, so um, we have 12 observations in our data set. So I'm going to start numbering off one, two, three, four, five, six, just to track the observations. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, uh, we have an observation, and we have an observation. In another dead spot, we have an observation squared. Okay, so uh, observations in our data set. We had uh, 9, 6, 5, 5, 5, uh, 6, 2, 8, uh, 3, 4, 8, 1. And then we're going to square each of these observations. So we'll get 81, uh, 36, uh, 25, three times, uh, 36, 4, uh, 64, 9, uh, 16, uh, 64, and 1. Okay, um, 
if you're also like you kind of want to work on this by hand a little bit but you don't want to completely trivialize the problem by going to r and asking for the variance and standard deviation because it'll just give it to you uh maybe this would be something to work on in excel uh because i because what i'm basically doing is being a a human excel spreadsheet at the very bottom i'm going to sum up these two columns the first column sums up to 62 and the second column consisting of squares sums up to 386. So now I want to compute uh, the sum of squared errors. And that's SXX. And we have our shortcut formula for computing that. Uh, that's going to be 386, which is the sum of the squares of the observations, minus 12, which is the sample size, times the mean. All right, we need to compute the mean. So the mean is going to be the sum of the observations, which is 62, divided by 12. So in this uh, parentheses, I'm gonna put 62 over 12 and square it. And you plug it into a calculator and the number that you get for the sum of squared errors is 197 divided by three, uh, which is as a decimal number, uh, 65.6, where the six is repeating. So the sample variance will be the sum of squared errors divided by, uh, as a reminder, the sample size minus one, which is going to be 65.6 divided by 12 minus one, which is 11, which is equal to 5.96, uh, where the nine six itself is repeating. Now, this is nice, but the thing is, the sample variance is in the, the units of the sample variance is goal squared. We don't like that. We want to compute the standard deviation too because that's a more interpretable number. So the standard deviation is going to be the square root of the variance, which is going to be about uh, 2.443, right into three decimal places. So you can think of this as your uh, daughter's soccer team is varying around their average uh, score of about five points, but they're, they're deviating from that by about two points. So on average, they'll be about two points away. Okay. All right. Uh, so in R, the functions that are responsible for computing these quantities are var and SD. R computes the variance and SD computes the standard deviation. So the var of the soccer data set is basically what I wrote down and the standard deviation is basically the same thing too. All right, so um, the sample mean, so for the sample variance, we actually have some nice properties that also translate into properties for uh, the standard deviation. Actually, before I continue on, I'm going to double check because this scares me. Okay, okay, everything is good, I'm scared. Okay, um, so uh, some uh, basic properties. Uh, let's suppose, for in this proposition, uh, let's suppose that we take our data set and then we shift everything by a constant to produce a new data set that's shifted by a constant. It turns out that the, sa the uh, sample variance for the new set data set will be the same as the sample variance for the old data set where you didn't shift. Uh, that's a good thing. What that means is basically this is in fact a measure of spread. If it wasn't a measure of spread, uh, well, basically if, the, if this was not the case, if the sample variance changed uh, by shifting the data, then it doesn't seem really fair to uh, call it a measure of of spread because it's also capturing location too but the fact that you don't have to uh the fact that it doesn't care about the location or in a way it doesn't actually care about the mean because and you can think of that as because it subtracts the mean out the mean out from the data set uh, the fact that it doesn't care means it is in fact a bona fide uh, measure of spread and not measuring something else along with it uh the second proposition says that the variance uh if you were to rescale your data set by C, uh, the variance will scale by C squared and the standard deviation will scale by the absolute value of C. So um, the standard deviation is always going to be positive 
uh, the variance will always be positive. Um, so when you rescale the data set, it's not going to... the, the Whether you multiply by a positive or a negative number doesn't actually matter. And also it tells you that... Um, if, like you can think of this as saying something about uh, unit conversions, uh, because remember that unit conversions uh, generally are multiplicative operations. If you wanted to change the units of the standard deviation, um, you could do so by just multiplying the original standard deviation by whatever unit conversion formula you have. And also, this is basically telling us what I was saying before that. Uh, the variance is in units squared, but the standard deviation is in just the same units as the data set. So these are good properties to be aware of. Um, okay, so the uh, the sample variance and standard deviation uh, these are one uh, these are these are these are one class of uh, estimator of spread. They're not the only ones. Oh, by the way, you. We did have this discussion when talking about measures of location about biasness. No, uh, no, not biasness. Um, um, sensitivity to outliers. Uh, it turns out that the sample mean and the sample standard, de uh, the sample variance and sample standard deviation, are also sensitive to outliers. In fact, they are more sensitive to outliers than the mean is. So they care a great deal about outliers too. Um, just throwing that out there. And you can kind of tell by looking at those formulas, since uh, when you look at them, they're basically means, right? They're averages, or at least the variance looks like an average, and the standard deviation is the square root of an average. So uh, if you end up having a very large error, then that's going to make your variance very large. So it's sensitive to outliers. Just mentioning that. Uh, another measure for spread is known as the fourth spread, or sometimes, like in Math 1070, we call it the interquartile range. It is the third quartile minus the first quartile. And we're going to denote it in this class with FS. Uh, this is another measure of dispersion. So let's compute the fourth spread for the soccer game scores. Uh, we already computed in, uh, in a previous uh, video... Uh, the third and first quartile for the soccer game uh, for the soccer games. So the fourth spread will be the third quartile minus the first quartile, which actually turns out for this data set to be eight minus four, which is equal to four. Okay. So the fourth spread is, in and of itself, a measure of dispersion. Uh, and one way statisticians might use the fourth spread is as a tool for outlier detection. Remember, we care a great deal about outliers. Uh, if there's an out, we would like to have outlier detection tools because if there is an outlier in this data set, we would like to investigate it further and decide how we should approach it and why the outlier is there. Outliers are very interesting aspects of data sets, so we would like to be able to detect them. Uh, so we might call an observation that is further than one and a half times the fourth spread from its nearest quartile, a mild outlier. So as an example, uh, let's suppose you have a data set. Our data set looks something like this. Here's kind of a, a dot plot sketch of our data set. And we've also got a couple observations over here. So those two observations visually look like outliers. What the four, is, let's suppose that we have the, uh, oh, I didn't realize that was a thing. Okay, uh, let's suppose that uh, our first and third quartiles are here and here. Okay? Um, if that is the case, uh, the fourth spread, or the IQR, is going to be the distance between uh, those two quartiles. So we'll call this Q1, Q3. Uh, the distance between those will be the fourth spread. So according to this rule, how you detect an outlier is you take this quantity and then increase it by uh, one and a half, uh, so one and a half, and go beyond, and, and you're gonna like see compare an observation to its nearest quartile. So these are going to be close to the third quartile because they're above the third quartile, um, and you um, 
compare, see if those observations are one and a half times the IQR away from their nearest quartile. And if they are beyond that range, then they are candidates to be outliers. So these are now starting to look like at least mild outliers. But in fact, if we were to uh, double that quantity, so three times the fourth spread, um, so that would look like this, turns out that they are beyond three times the fourth spread as well. So now these are looking like extreme outliers. We could also do the same thing on the left-hand side of the data set, look for uh, outliers that are, you know, numbers that are really small. There's nothing that says that outliers have to always be large numbers. They can also be really small numbers too. Uh, and there's no outliers on the left-hand side in this data set. Uh, I should point out, it's tempting for students to think that what I just gave you is a definition for outliers. The word outlier is intentionally vague because there's many different ways you could define an outlier. This is one such definition or one such uh, criterion for deciding if something is an outlier. This criterion would not work if we were to go into two dimensions. It is a one-dimensional uh, one dimensional approach, not a two-dimensional approach. And you can still have uh, outliers in two dimensions or in bivariate data. And uh, uh, you can still have outliers there and they're going to behave like there's more possibilities the moment you've moved onto a plane as opposed to just a number line. More ways for things to be outliers. Um, so um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to allow to just let students think that this is what an outlier is. There's actually different ways to think about outliers. We could come up with different definitions based off of our problem and how we want to approach it. So... Um, so we could, we could choose a procedure that is tailored to our problem to define outliers so that it's most useful to us. So this is what we're using in this class, but it is far from like what we'd always use. Okay, and it is not really the definition of an outlier. We would just say that an outlier is a point that, that seems unusual to the other points, that seems to be distant in some way from the other points, um, or it doesn't seem to follow the same pattern as the rest of the data. Okay, so moving on into example 16, uh, use the fourth spread to detect outliers in soccer game scores. What is the minimum score needed for a data point to be a mild outlier or an extreme outlier? So the fourth spread, as you may recall from above, was four. So 1.5, eh, I don't want that green, that color. All right, so 1.5 times the fourth spread is going to be four times 1.5, which is going to be six. Uh, and three times the fourth spread is going to be 12. So uh, let's see what it would take for something to be considered at least a mild outlier. To be mild, you would have to possibly uh, exceed the third quartile plus 1.5 times the fourth spread, which is going to be 8 plus 6, which is 14. There were no double digit scores in our soccer data set. So that means that there were no outliers, at least on the positive end. And as for the negative end, uh, in order for something to be so small that it's an outlier, it would have to be less than Q1 minus uh, 1.5 times the fourth spread, which is going to be, uh, that's gonna be four minus six, which is negative two. Well, negative soccer scores are impossible. So there's not going to be any mild outliers on the left-hand side, which means that there are no outliers in this data set. Now that's it. Let's, let's go ahead and continue on just, just for fun. Let's see what it would take for something to be an extreme outlier. To be an extreme outlier, you, you would have to exceed Q3 plus 3FS, which is 8 plus 12 which is uh, 20. So in other words, the other team didn't show up. Uh, to be on the left-hand side, you'd uh, to be an outlier on the left-hand side, you have to be less than Q1 minus 3FS, which is um, uh, 4 minus 12, uh, which, is negative, which is negative 8. 
and no way that's going to happen. So there are no outliers in our data set. Okay. So uh, there is another visualization method that I would like to discuss that we weren't able to discuss in section two. The reason why is because this is a box plot and box plots require uh, the five number summary, which is the minimum max. So the five number summary is the minimum, uh, maximum, median, first and third quartiles. So you need to have that in order to be able to compute a box plot uh, and create a box plot. That's why we didn't talk about it before because we hadn't actually talked about those things. Uh, so, um, so for a box plot, we first compute those quantities uh, on a number line, which could, this could be a vertical number line or it could be a horizontal number line if you want uh, box plots oriented horizontally or oriented vertically. Either one is fine. Whatever, whatever suits your needs, do whatever you want. Okay, but on a number line, uh, let's say something like this, we're going to draw a box. So we've got uh, the first quartile and the third quartile. We're going to draw a box whose ends are at those quartiles. We're also going to draw a line in that box corresponding to the location of the median. Uh, we will then draw what are known as whiskers that extend out to the maximum and to the minimum. So the whiskers will extend out to extend out to the extrema of the data set. Um, and that's that's a box plot. Now I should point out that R does not draw box plots this way by default. R does something different. R will actually try to detect outliers and it will draw the whiskers out to the observations that are not outliers. So the largest observation that is not an outlier and the smallest observation that is not an outlier. The outliers are treated differently. They get their own points in the box plot, kind of like with the dot plot. Uh, that's more complicated to do and I'm not going to ask you to do that. Uh, using just the five number summary and extending out to the maxima is fine for me. And I feel like it, that if you were ever to draw a box plot by hand, you should just keep things simple because you can, it's not too hard to compute a five number summary if you, especially if you had say, um, uh, if you had like a stem and leaf plot, but a box plot, uh, like computing the outliers is a bit much. So, um, a box plot on its own, I mean, it's okay. But a box plot really shines when there are other box plots with it. And when you have that, you can now start drawing comparative box plots. And when you have comparative box plots, you can start to say things about the relationships amongst different groups that, uh, like, like if you want to compare different data sets, you may have a data, you may have two data sets for two uh, similar but not the same populations. Uh, like for example, men and women. Men and women are both human, uh, but if you were to compare height, you would probably want to differentiate between men and women. So you could have a box plot uh, for men's heights and you can have a box plot for women's heights and then you can make comparisons and you could compare, in this case, this looks like, uh, if, if this were in fact talking about men's and women's heights, this would be uh, suggesting that men tend to be taller than women. Um, so one thing that you could do when looking at a comparative box plot is compare lo the location of the boxes. You can also compare the spreads of the boxes. So we, for example, if we saw one box plot that looks like this for one group and a box plot that looks like this for another group, we might say that those two groups certainly have different spread. Okay, so you can start making comparisons that are more easily made with, with plots such as these than if you were to say, try to overlap density plots or something. Um, so comparative box plots are very nice because they allow you to, at a glance, compare two different groups and their distributions. So let's go ahead and uh, start creating some box plots. Uh, in this example, uh, we're using a data set from R. Uh, in, in this example, we're studying, we're studying the tooth growth of guinea pigs that were given a vitamin C supplement via orange juice at three different dosage levels. Uh, here's a bunch of R code 
that takes the tooth growth data set and transforms it into a format that is um, uh, nice for this problem where uh, it did not look like this before. It, go ahead and look at the tooth growth data set. It does not look like this at all. Uh, for starters, the tooth growth data set also includes um, a group where the guinea pigs were given vitamin C, like a vitamin C supplement directly rather than through via orange juice. Um, and we've completely excluded that group using this filter command. These are known as pipes. They are part of the Dippler package. Um, so we um, fi um, filtered so that we were looking at only orange juice we selected uh, the length and the dosage uh, as the variables we were interested in and then did some other stuff so that uh, the data came in a format that I liked, which is where um, it's ordered from smallest to largest for each of these three groups. And we have the half dosage group, full dosage group, and double dosage group. Okay. So, uh, all right. So, and the data set is ordered, which means it's going to be uh, somewhat easy to compute a five number summary for each of these three groups. So for, ex so for instance, uh, the last row is gonna be the maximum for the three groups, and the first row is gonna be the minimum for the three groups. Uh, as for the other quantities, we also need the median. So there are 10 observations for each group. So, um, the median is going to be the average of the fifth and the sixth rows. So uh, the medians, after we compute those averages, or, or midpoints if you prefer, the medians for uh, the half dosage group, uh, its median is uh, 12.25. For the full dosage group, it's going to be 23.45. And for the double dosage group, it's going to be 25.95. Okay, um, so those are the medians. Now we need to compute the first quartile. Uh, remember what we do is we split the data set in half and then look at uh, the median for the smaller data set or the lower data set. This will be the first quartiles. And the median for the third uh, data set, remember that both of these data sets have five observations each after we do the splitting. Uh, so the median for the upper data set, that will be the third quartile. Okay, so we now have everything we need to start constructing our box plots. Okay, so I'm going to construct these this by hand. Uh, I don't want that. Uh, let's make it black. Isn't that a song? Okay. Oh yeah, I want to paint it black. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that is a song. All right. Um, I want to paint it black. Uh, anyway, uh, so um, I have the half dosage group, the full dosage group, and a the double dosage group. Uh, I'm going to have my box plot end at 31 up here, and we're going to start down here at 8. So we're going to go 8, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And then we go 19, 20, uh, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, uh, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. Okay, all right. So we've got our scale. Uh, so for our first group, uh, let's zoom out a little bit. So for the first group, the median, uh, the minimum was 8.2. So minimum of 8.2, we'll put a dot right there. Uh, then we go to the first quartile. So that's going to be uh 9.7 that's about there um then we've got 12.25 that's about there uh q3 is 16.5 that's about 13 uh, that's about there and finally the maximum is 21.5 uh 
So that is going to be about uh, there. Okay. So then uh, we have a box, the median, and the whiskers. All right, so there's our first box plot. All right, so now for full dosage. Uh, scrolling up a little bit. So for full dosage, the minimum is at uh, 14.5, which is about there. Uh, then we have a quartile at 20, which is about there. Uh, the median's at 23.45, so that's about there. Uh, Q3 is at 25.8, so that's about there. Um, and then uh, the maximum is at 27.3, so that's about there. Okay, so draw the box and the line for the median and, it, and draw out the whiskers. Okay, and finally for the double dosage group, the minimum is at 22.5, which is about there. Uh, the first quartile is at 24.5, which is about there. Uh, the median is at 25.95, which is about there. Uh, the uh, third quartile is at 27.3, which is about uh, there. And the maximum is at uh, 30.9, which is about there. So draw the box. Draw the line for the median, extend out the whiskers, and there we go. All right, and now we have a box plot, a comparative box plot. And what can we see? Uh, we can see that, in fact, increasing the dosage does seem to increase the tooth growth length. We also see that there's much more spread in the half and full dose than there is for the double dose, which is an interesting fact. Uh, all right, so moving on, uh, there is um, an R function called box plot that can construct these box plots for you. This is largely in agreement with what we drew. Um, and as a reminder, R doesn't by default uh, produce box plots in the way that I just described, where it draws whiskers out to the minimum and the maximum. It does something a little bit different, where it will um, uh draw it out to the largest and smallest observations that are not outliers, and then draw the outliers as their own individual points. Okay, uh, there's actually one more visualization that's similar to a box plot that I would like to discuss. Um, I didn't discuss it in the lecture notes because you can't really draw it by hand. Uh, but I've got a computer in front of me. Okay, very quickly. Okay, everything seems to be fine. Okay. Um, so you can't really draw it by hand uh, because, uh-oh, what was that? Uh, 